I'm Mark Marquette, and I'm welcoming you to the American Space Museum, as we might have had a little hiccup in the start there. That's okay. We got Selvin Trotter here on our board, and thank you, Selvin, for running the board today, giving Marty the day off. And uh, thank you all for staying curious today, as you know that for over 25 years, the American Space Museum has been preserving the birth of the American Space Age right here in the cradle of Brevard County. And we love seeing this scene behind us, these noisy SpaceX rockets in the middle of the night, rattling our windows, waking up our dogs, and putting satellites in outer space so the whole world can eventually be under a internet umbrella, I guess. But this is their typical launch from my uh, neighborhood, and they're fun to watch, and we're going to celebrate SpaceX a little bit today as they achieved quite a milestone. So this is the launch last night going over my property, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, in Port St. John, about 30 miles away where that picture's taken there. We're going to tell you about SpaceX. We got an astronaut birthday. We got some alien soil that's brought back to the Earth for the first time. And uh, did you know there's going to be an eclipse over Disney World here in uh, Orlando. It's going to be a couple decades away, but we'll tease you about that too to stay curious. So everybody, we love you. We love how you support the museum and we will be launching a Galaxy of Giving campaign so that we can keep our doors open beginning November 1st. That is our QR code there to give us any kind of money. But uh, we've got everybody on uh, deck uh, with our board of directors to raise some serious capital gains money that we need to keep our humble nonprofit alive. Uh, this is all not uh, the urgency right now is because of somehow the how our auction that sustained us is going to be changed a little bit. But also we're not getting our share of the grants and so forth that's being uh, given out and some of them in fact have disappeared. So. Uh, Galaxy of Giving will be launched November 1st. We've got lots of ways to reward you for your financial donation to the American Space Museum. But we got a happy birthday, Selvin, today. Yes, birthday boy is 63 years old. He is the first full-blooded Polish American to go to space, so I'm going to slaughter his name. Happy birthday, Jim Pawlowski, P-A-W-E-L-C-Z-Y-K, Pawlowski. The first American Polish descent, one-time payload specialist, James Anthony Polazic is. He was born September 20th, 1960 in Buffalo, New York, but he grew up in Elma, a suburb of Buffalo. Spent 16 days in space, all right, on STS-90 in April 1998. That was a Columbia NeuroLab mission. Uh, 16 days for one mission. There's some people that go to space three or four times. Uh, like our Mercury and Gemini astronauts that didn't spend that much time in space. Uh, Polish cosmonaut uh, Hermanowski was the first pole in space in 1978 uh, as part of the Soviet bloc uh, program of taking their friends up to space. Um, but uh, he also went to Republic of Poland and presented the Polish flag that he flew on board there proudly. So he's got um, mom and pop were Polish descent, so he is the first true American Polish person to go up there. Very smart man, degrees in biology, psychology, physiology. He wrote a book, Blood Loss and Shock, published in 1994. He is a principal investigator or co-investigator on 11 federal and state grant contracts and uh, very involved in the academic community is Pawlowski. And he testifies in front of the U.S. Senate all the time on uh, physiological things, what's going on to International Space Station. So happy 63rd birthday to you, Jim Palazowski there. Palazowski. I told you I'd kill it, though. Well, we would always love talking about Robert Goddard, and I put this one of his great sayings up there. This saying is, It is difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And what prophetic words to think about a, a first stage rocket 
that is launched 17 times and brought back to Earth safely. And that's what this image is all about there, the launch last night uh, of SpaceX's tail number rocket is tail number 10B1060. And it took its 17th trip to space, going up over 20 miles, coming back down to Earth and landing on a barge, an uncrewed barge out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So SpaceX has pushed the boundaries uh, further than anybody thought. Here's a typical shot from uh, 30 miles away in the backyard during the day. We haven't had too many day launches. In fact, that day launch was the first one, and I think they said 14 launches, Selvin. Uh, Tuesday night, uh, the, the Falcon 9 first stage marked its 17th flight from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral with 22 satellites for the Starlink Internet Network. That was 11.38 last night. I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, there's the, the shot going up there into the clouds uh, from my neighborhood. The booster first flew in 2020, three years ago carrying a GPS satellite for the U.S. Air Force. It has involved in 11 Starlink delivery flights, no crewed flights, but uh, quite a few uh, uh, satellites for paid customers, too. Uh, it was the 20th launch last night of the so-called V-2 Mini Starlinks. There's a Starlink coming back. Thank you, Carlton Bailey, for this photograph. Uh, I think that was the crewed launch that came back a month ago. Uh, these 20 launches of their upgraded V-2 satellite, uh, which are larger and have four times the bad bandwidth of previous satellite versions. Over 5,300 Starlink satellites are orbiting the Earth right now, Selvin. And SpaceX has a uh, clearance to, for 15,000, uh, of which they've done uh, over five. And then they're looking to add another 20,000, maybe. We had a Terry White program on space debris, and this is going to create space debris, is all these satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, some of them, just think of cars. You have that many vehicles up there. Uh, some of them blow a, a tire out. Some of them have blown out some of their infrastructure, uh, uh, and that could cause debris. Now, none of them have blown up, I'm saying, but some of them have just failed by pieces and parts on them not working right. Uh, beautiful to watch the launches. Uh, there is a beautiful shot uh, by Carlton Bailey of uh, a SpaceX uh, carrying a payload up there in its fairing. Um, the full size, all right, these are the mini Starlinks. Now, the full size were due to be launched by the Starship, but the delay in the Starship has led the company to create a condensed version of satellites that could be launched on the Falcon 9. And I watched this. These satellites are deployed. They were spitting them out like a Pez dispenser out of the second stage rocket. Instead, they just put them all out there in orbit, and then they are released like a, a new Pez dispenser that's already in orbit and not part of the second stage that carried it up there. Always beautiful to look up those nine Merlin engines there like Carlton Bailey is here. And uh, having seen a couple hundred of these launches now, like we all have, if you just casually see them, you realize that they have a cycle to them where the two-minute stage, when the first stage, uh, particularly at night, it's fun to watch the flame. Particularly this flame goes from a hot red all right, to, to, uh, then this blue tint starts coming out as the fuel, for whatever reason, color changes from red to a turquoise blue. And there you see the nine Merlin engines on the right. You can just barely see the, each of the nozzle exhausts there. Uh, and then when that happens, you know it's going to go out for about five seconds. And then it, initially you see a, a, a blast of light from that first stage igniting to orient itself. And then you see the second stage, a tiny little light as it goes on and on. Boy, on a clear night, you can see that thing fly for uh, five or six minutes, that second stage. So that's what it looks like here on the Space Coast to enjoy the launches of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, incredibly one of the most 
well, it's got to be now the 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 most reliable, most used rocket of all time. Um, uh, now, and one of them now has taken 17 trips to space and back. Another one has 16. He's got a bunch of them that have 10 flights. They were originally going to have 10 flights. Of course, billionaire, multi-billionaire Elon Musk is going to risk his own satellites and waste his own money if one of them would fail or blow up. And at this point, that's the only reason to watch one with a camera is that if you're not and that happens to have a anomaly and blows up, you're going to wish you had a camera. But uh, uh, it does make some fun entertainment around here and not belittling the fact that these are rocket launches. We know that many of you coming from Michigan, Iowa, Ohio, New York, wherever, on vacation, this might be the only rocket launch you see your entire life. And that is an interesting aspect when I'm looking at people at Space View Park, just wondering, will any of them ever see another launch here? As I'm seeing, you know, I'm actually counting the ones I've missed in six years of living here, okay, to kind of figure out that I've probably seen over 300 launches now. So it's great to live here, unless you have some dogs that are woke up by those noisy rockets. Uh, it's still a neat rumble. I've slept through a few of them, I got to admit, so... Good luck to SpaceX continued uh, that doing a great thing uh, for our nation in putting uh, uh, military satellites up. Uh, we've got to launch uh, about every four or five days around here, and we're all looking forward to the next, really, Fal the Falcon 9 Heavy launch will be uh, October 5th, it's scheduled for, and that is the Psyche mission to the spacecraft is called Psyche, and it's going to investigate an all-metal asteroid, a heavy metal asteroid out there uh, called Psyche, uh, just to see what's up with that. So, All right, we also want to promote today that if you haven't seen it, go on Amazon Prime if you have it, and watch A Million Miles Away. Michael Pena stars in that. Uh, he's a well-known Hollywood actor as astronaut Jose Hernandez, who goes from a migrant worker boy in the fields picking onions and and, and, and uh, tomatoes, uh, putting what they call migrant workers proudly say, we put America's food on your table, and they certainly do. And this is a, a story that gave me goosebumps, gave me a few teary-eyed moments there. It's really a neat story. I'm sure it's much like everybody's astronaut story that applied 12 times, like Jose Hernandez did, got rejected 11 times. Uh, uh, a lot of them is persistence. They have a great life. They have a great uh, career uh, in something else, and yet they want to be an astronaut. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Connie McDaniel, for sending me this uh, uh, newspaper article for all of you that haven't seen a newspaper in a while. Me and Miles starts with Earthly Journey. Uh, one of the reviewers for the Florida Today gave it a two thumbs up, if you would, to watch this Amazon Prime movie. Uh, and I enjoy it. And I understand it's going to be in the uh, theaters, maybe uh, in select cities. Uh, and we were privileged, we, a few of us here at the American Space Museum, or any of you that were season ticket holders at the Kennedy Visitors Complex, we were invited to a special showing of that about two weeks ago. So highly encourage you to see A Million Miles Away based on the true story of astronaut Jose Hernandez, who was a pilot on STS-128, I believe, right at the end of the program. All right. Well, we love looking at space history, and today in space history, this artist's rendering of a spacecraft landed on the moon, a Russian spacecraft called Luna 16. All right. Now, remember, Luna 25 crashed about a month ago on the moon where Russia was trying to land a, 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 a for the first time in 47 years, something on the moon. Well, this was 1970. And they made it in 1970, but they didn't make it in 2023. And boy, is Russia Space Agency embarrassed by this failure because India su uh, succeeded in landing a lander and a rover uh, just days after they crashed. Well, let's talk about 53 years ago when Luna 16 was the first spacecraft to safely land on the moon and then 
bring back some of the moon uh, because of its sophisticated uh, parts here. What you see here is the first robotic probe to land on the moon was launched today uh, by Russia. And uh, within 24 hours, it had scooped up a sample of the moon, three grams of it, three and a half grams. It landed on Mare Fecundutatis. Fecundutatis is the Latin name for fertility. So Mare Fecundutatis is the first place that a robot landed to bring back some of the moon. It was the third lunar sample brought back. Of course, Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 will beat this robot. But this is what they were trying to do with Luna uh, 615 in July. They were trying to beat the Earth, uh, beat the America by bringing back a sample of the moon before we did. And had uh, their Luna 15 gone as scheduled, they probably would have brought back a sample before us. The capsule parachuted down uh, in Kazakhstan on uh, September 24th, okay, four days after the launch. So that's uh, uh, really a quick mission to the moon and back. Uh, first time that we got samples of any world, and here was the TASS news agency, the Soviet propaganda machine, released this photo of a tray, so to speak. What happened was the lunar probe landed and drilled down about an inch and a half, uh, about three inches into the lunar surface. And uh, uh, it may have done this twice to get that arm went up and up at the very top, you see that bulbous uh, object there. That is where the lunar soil was deposited. And then that was launched back to earth course no atmosphere on the moon a very easy solid rocket uh, motor could boost it there but it was a very small contraption there that did this to bring that soil back it was actually laid out like that in pictures that we got to see years later but uh, that this is like dirt you got some pebbles in there some soil in there but very exciting to get this back all right uh from the surface of the moon uh, and in fact, we know where that is. This is Luna 16 as photographed by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's been operating 12 years. There's the close-up inset there. You can see the dark area is from the landing engines spraying the lunar surface around there. So that's the area, that's the actual Luna 16 on the moon in Merfica de uh, 53 years ago. Um, now, this was the first uh, soil sample. Uh, Soviets celebrated their triumphs. There it gives you an idea of the launch off of the moon, uh, the whole little complex there after they put the soil in it, uh, in a capsule that was recovered uh, after re-entry at a parachute landing. And uh, the soil resembled that brought back by Apollo 12, according to samples years later. Three tiny samples, 0.2 grams, were sold at a Sotheby's auction for $442,500 in 1993. You got that kind of pocket change, Selvin, there? Ooh. So uh, uh, $442,000 in 1993, the person that bought that resold them at a Sotheby's auction for almost twice as much. Eight hundred and eighty-five, eight hundred fifty-five thousand dollars in uh, twenty eighteen. So that was uh, fifteen years later. No, twenty-eight years later. Uh, uh, Twenty-five years later, they sold it, doubled their price. So uh, you're not allowed to own uh, any of the Apollo moon soil. If you do, you could get in a lot of trouble. Uh, so, uh, but there are some black market moon samples out there and we thought it'd be interesting to show how we collected samples on the moon thank you nick enix our collection manager for uh getting together with me when i was telling him i was looking for things to talk about today well here i have a lunar sample bag number 26 that was uh uh used they would put these together in a cup all right you see the cup there you have a little uh, they'd be on top of one another and you'd pull them out of the uh, place on the lunar rover or the rickshaw that Apollo 14 used. You see the tab on there, so they're big 
mitts could get a hold of that. Then they had a, we don't have a scoop, but they'd either scoop this up themselves or put soils in there. The bag is numbered. This is, can be pushed closed, all right, uh, on there. And uh, then we have another bag here that has a sample bag that has metal tongs on it, all right. And the astronauts would put soil in that. It's just a little metal hinge there that they could over close it there. That's not zip tie or anything like that. And I'm kind of, I'm smelling it like there's moon dust in there, Selvin. But that reminds me, what did the moon smell like, folks? When you see lunar soil, what did it smell like? All right. Well, the astronauts couldn't take their helmets off and smell it. They smelled it when they got inside the lunar module after their spacewalk, their EVA on the surface. And uh, they could, all over them, lunar Dust clings to you like talcum powder, like flour, all right, in uh, in your kitchen. Just clings to everything. And when you start pounding on it, it just keeps deeper into your cloth. So, but it smelled like, to the astronauts in the lunar module, smelled like spent gunpowder. It smelled like a musty fireplace. You have this impact smell. Of, of And when you look at the moon and all of the impact craters, 30,000 of them I can see with my backyard telescope alone. And then you go down and see samples like this right down to uh, a, a meter or two. There's, there's just craters everywhere. So the impact from meteoroids hitting the moon's surface uh, has created a smell in the, the, the lunar soil that's called regolith like this the uh pop pistol a cat pistol is a is a boy playing with that that sulfur cat pistol smell is what the moon shows up so two actual not used on the moon but used in training left over from training that we have in our museum to show you what things look like from the apollo astronauts and we love sharing things in our museum they are real items not made up items okay don't know what our auctioneer chuck jeffrey would sell that for but saying the word auction that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow is our next auction coming up october 7th and i'll have a lot of items to talk about that tomorrow about on stay curious so well we also want to remind everybody that as we look at these uh samples that we've got that is the india rover on the moon Pengyong, all right and the stationary vehicle uh there and the rover have gone into a sleep. They're at the South Pole about a week ago, about two weeks ago, actually. Night fell over the South Pole of the moon, all right? Uh, and like the poles at the Earth, you know, you have a little different cycle there than if you're uh, 28 days usually from sunrise to sunset on the moon. But at the poles, it's a lot different. So we're expecting in a couple days, like around September 23rd, to find out, did the little rover survive the night of 200 below zero? It's not anticipated that it, did, it would. It wasn't designed to. It did all of its little things it was supposed to on the moon. Makes, makes finding water on the moon is what it did. The frozen areas, the indicators in the soil that, yeah, there's uh, water there. But it didn't find the water to be as old as they thought it would. Not water, I should say ice. It's, uh, <clears throat> if, the, if it would be heated up to 200 degrees, it would evaporate right away. This is ice buried underneath the soil in the South Pole. So we'll be looking forward to see if India's little rover and its stationary science station come, come alive here. Uh, they're thinking around September 23rd in three days. So that would be the, the weekend. Well, here's a little something to help you stay curious that I'll bet you don't know. On this date, September 20th, yes, that's President Kennedy giving a speech, our beautiful president. And those are drawings by Chris Kelly, our friend. Uh, artist Chris Kelly uh, does this on postage uh, stamp uh, envelopes. Postal covers is what I'm trying to say. That is his father's moon landing stamp up there uh, on the, the top one. And uh, But this is all to say that on this date in 1963, September 20th, President Kennedy addressed the United Nations Assembly, and he didn't talk about going to the moon like he did in his 
two famous speeches at Rice University, which was also in September 1962, and then he talked in May of 62 to Congress about going to the moon. No, no. President Kennedy addressed the United Nations 60 years ago today, suggesting the possibility of a Russian-American cooperation in space. Although not pr proposing any specific program, Kennedy stated, quote, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity, the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the re regulation exploration of space. I conclude among the possibilities, I include among the possibilities, Kennedy said, a joint expedition to the moon. In 1963, after he'd already proposed going to the moon, Surely we would explore whether the scientists and astronauts of our two countries, indeed of all the world, cannot work together in the conquest of space, spending some day in this decade to the moon, sending some day in this decade to the moon, not representatives of a single nation, but the representatives of all humanity. So don't know if this is sort of a backtracking after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, or, uh, uh, but uh, this was September uh, 20th, 1963, and of course the president would be assassinated two months after this speech. Uh, but an interesting, con uh, interesting little known fact about President Kennedy wanting to align with the, the Russians to go to the moon after proposing the, his great moon speech uh, just a year before. To that end, our shuttles of the month of September include uh, STS-79. STS-79 was uh, launched on September 16th, 1996. It was an exchange of American crew members on the Russian Mir space station, hence the handshake of a Russian and American, the Russian flag, their red, white, and blue on the, the right, our red, white, and blue on the left. STS-79 had some great astronauts on it, but it dropped off John Blaha for his stay on, on the, uh, the space station. And it uh, picked up Shannon Lucid, who had a special plea on this J September 20th, 1996 wake-up call, Selvin. That plea was from Shannon Lucid for a cheeseburger in paradise. The wake-up song for STS-79 on this date in 1996 was Cheeseburger in Paradise by the late Jimmy Buffett, referring to Shannon Luce's thoughts of her diet upon returning from Earth. She said, I'm having a cheeseburger from my favorite place in Houston when I get back. So, uh, And we, we love Jimmy Buffett, and God bless him. I passed away here about a month ago, very... Uh, active aviator and always interested in helping promote the space program with NASA. And there you see his CDs packed up there. So kind of makes me hungry too, right, Selvin? There is the STS-79 crew in space on this date, or around this date, 1996. Uh, Shannon Lucid, of course, is on the far right. You've got two Russians there. And John Blaha is always already in his Russian uh, blue garb there uh, as part of their expedition crew up there. So, uh, and look at the mess in front of there. That's literally their food uh, quarters there on the Mir space station. So, uh, President Kennedy, the dream did come alive for you uh, when you talked to the United Nations that these two superpowers could cooperate and we need each other to build the International Space Station. Don't know which direction we're going to go when the space station that is in its last years of, 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 of usability uh, has to be decommissioned. But uh, we're, hit, we're thinking of SCS-79. We'll end the program today with uh, our museum friend, Derek Demeter, who's the planetarium director at the ML Bueller Planetarium in nearby Sanford uh, at the um, Seminole State College. Derek did a talk about the two solar eclipses that are gonna happen. Uh, in the next six months. October 14th is going to be what they call an annular ring of fire eclipse, and the totality band is out in the west uh, uh, United States. Uh, you will not see the sun completely blotted out by the moon because it's what we call a micro moon. The moon is further away. The super moon is when it's close to us, but the micro moon at aphelion 
a field is, is uh, some 230,000 miles away and it's appreciably smaller. So it doesn't cover up the full moon, the, the full sun, like it's going to April 8th when we're, when it's going to be closer to the earth and cover up the sun completely in a beautiful April 8th total eclipse that's going to be taking place uh, over my hometown of Finley, Ohio, where it all began for me. So I'm looking forward to uh, spending uh, that eclipse with my 91-year-old mother. Uh, uh, whether it's cloudy or not, it'll still get dark, and I'm not going to run to be underneath the eclipse umbrella. I want to be there with my mom, who's been so helpful in promoting my astronomy as I, when I was a kid, and uh, of course, uh, always been uh, supporting me with these endeavors here. So, uh, kind of, how cool is that, huh, folks? Well, it's not as cool. By the way, here in Florida and anywhere outside those bands, you're going to get a partial eclipse of the sun. And here in Florida, Selvin, it'll be about 50% covered. And our Brevard Astronomical Society is going to have an event at the Merritt Island Veterans Memorial Center. That eclipse time will be from about 1130 on Saturday, April 4th, uh, October 14th. Uh, until about 3.30 in the afternoon. It's about a four-hour process. So uh, we'll see a half eclipse here. And you will be you can watch it online. They'll call it the Ring of Fire eclipse. Do not look at the sun with any optical instrument or your own eyes. You'll go blind. I promise you, do not do that. There's plenty of people that will help you with that. Well, God, how cool is that to be in my hometown on a uh, total eclipse of the moon? And, and you know, uh, 60 years later when I started the, my astronomy love. Well, I'll tell you what, Derek Demeter enlightened me that it's not going to be quite as cool as August 2045. When see the eclipse, totality is going right over Florida. And guess what, Selvin? How cool will it be? On August, I think it's August uh, 12th, there it is, August 12th, 2045, to be standing in Disney World and have a total eclipse over the, the, the uh, what do they call it, kingdom there? What's that called? The Magic Kingdom. Magic kingdom. Yeah. Uh, so that will be a photographer's paradise there, you better believe it. Uh, I'm not sure what time of day that, that happens, but uh, those are the only three eclipses uh, in the next 20 years over America uh, or North America, as you could put it that way. And uh, 2045, let's see, Selvin, let me figure out my age, carry the one. Uh, I could do it if I may, if I live as long as my mother, and I, I will be seeing it there. And, I, and that's something to live forward to. So we'll hope you all enjoyed Stay Curious today. Uh, going to leave you today by encouraging you to go, go out and get a little moonshine, okay? The moon is first quarter phase on Friday, so it's a nice crescent moon up there. Everybody's going to look up at it and get you a little moonshine. After all, that's the only kind of moonshine you can't get too much of. The sun is over here. I'm the sun, okay, with my vest on here. The sun is to the right side, so you can see by this chart that uh, why we have new moon is the backside of the moon is illuminated. And we can't see that on Earth, as you see in the middle chart there. And we are up at the top up there at first quarter where uh, half of the moon is always illuminated. We're just seeing half of the half we see illuminated, which gets confusing. When you say third quarter at the bottom there, uh, and I always want to say fourth quarter because of football. But gibbous is the phases between first quarter and the new moon or full moon stages there uh waning gibbous or waxing gibbous wax means it is heading towards full wane means it's heading heading away from it there so hope you go out there i encourage you to embrace the moon and away from your backyard like you never have before write a poem about it all right i love doing sketches of the moon they mean nothing to anybody but me there's a sketch i made of the carpathian mountains in a section a little section of the moon all right the round area is my eyepiece that you're looking through that's not the moon i should square it off there to show people that uh that's sort of what i'm seeing through the eyepiece 
uh, don't claim to be an artist whatsoever, but I enjoy sketching. And these shadows of these mountain peaks change by the hour. That's what's fun is you go out and look at them later and they've gotten shorter as the, the sun's climbed higher over that part of the moon. And as you're looking at the moon and it gets the full phase, remember two things. One, you can always cover it up with your little finger. It's only a half a degree across, so I'll stretch your hand. Though it looks as big as a beach ball when it's coming up over the ocean or your a building or trees or mountains. You can always cover it up with your little finger. It's a half a degree across. So, Selvin, you know ge geometry, 90 degrees at the horizon to directly overhead. So that's 180 moons you could stack end to end to end. And then another 180 moons. 360 moons would pan from horizon to horizon. That's so incredible to think because it's so big in our eyes. This blue is not, it's just to emphasize the lunar seas are not lava. They're lava seas that have frozen. The lava bubbled up three billion years ago when all of these planets were forming and it bubbled up in uh, like a 10 weight oil. Five ways. It's not like molasses. It's not thick like your syrup on your pancakes. It's very liquidy. And these big areas were filled in by asteroid impacts. You see that big oval right there? That's Mare Chrism. That was an asteroid that hit there. Over here's another asteroid, Mare Imbrium, that hit there. And then the bigger pieces become litter, littler as time went on. And this one down here at the bottom, Tycho, that smacked the moon maybe 50 million years ago, pretty pretty recently there. So the dark areas aren't seas, but actually that's why they were named Mare, Latin for seas, because they thought they were. In fact, 100 years ago, many famous astronomers thought that the moon would be inhabited. They thought, why not? Life should be everywhere. Uh, the great astronomer Herschel thought that there has to be people on the moon. William Herschel, he thought there'd be vegetation uh, on Venus, all right? Uh, even living creatures on, on all the planets, including Mars. So today, we kind of have gone the other way. We're, we're, uh, we're 100 years ago, he thought life would be everywhere and easy to find. Now we're saying, well, we're not going to tell you if we found it or not. Uh, but I'm convinced that there's microbes out there in somebody's uh, test tube that came from an asteroid or a uh, something. So anyway, we hope that you've enjoyed today's Stay Curious with us today. If you haven't, don't tell anybody, please. Okay. But uh, thank you, Selvin, for pinch hitting for uh, our faithful Marty Winkle today there. Uh, anything that we have to comment or, or say about how, who's been watching today, Selvin? We got Mark Kuziak. Hello, Mark. Bill, uh, William, uh, William Whiting. Cynthia Rossi, Doug Forrest, Robert Law, Neil 1030, Tom Thumb, The Astronaut Files. Who? And, Tom who? Tom Thumb. Oh, Tom Thumb. Okay. Tom Thumb. We had Tom <laughs> Jones, the astronaut, on here. And uh, Dave Stange, who says his birthday is, is next month, and he's going to give us a gift for his birthday. Well, he says that um, he may give us a gift for his birthday, but I have spoken. Thank you, Dave Stangy. Of course, one of our number one fans out there up in Michigan has been in our museum before, and uh, he's, he's anxious to financially help the museum any way he can, and we hope you all are too. So thank you, Selvin, very much. I'm showing my lunar, just imagining that Pete Conrad may have had this in his, ha his, uh, his mitts there at one point in time. So thank you, everybody. Tomorrow we're going to feature our October 7th um, uh auction uh, show you some of the items that you can see for bid up there this is a very serious auction this is how we keep our doors open of course and we are trying to become less dependent on these auctions that uh, are done by uh, our awesome collection analyst chuck jeffrey and uh, chuck's also our chief operating officer and uh, we are very ambitiously trying to find ways that we can uh, suck more money in the bank and be less stressed about running your favorite nonprofit, the U.S. Space Walk of Fame and our American Space Museum. So until tomorrow, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.